that's kind of. I'm going to record you if you don't mind, so I can put it up on the uh, South State Angler site. Sorry for the. Oh no worries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so some of the uh, about the ten to fifteen years of research we've done that's led to some meaningful actions for protecting the species and the, and the shallow water fishery for uh, for permit. So before I go into that, a little bit about Bonefish and Tarpon Trusts. We are a science-based nonprofit aimed at conserving populations of snook, tarpon, permit, and bonefish and their habitats throughout the Florida and also throughout the Caribbean. Our, our, our stronghold is South Florida, but we have conservation and research hubs in Belize and Mexico and in the Bahamas. We partner with researchers in Cuba to address some, to help them with some of their fisheries issues. We also work in Puerto Rico. We, our, our, our mission and our conservation program is really de designed through partnerships. We partner with partners with anglers. Anglers really help us identify problems with the fisheries and the habitats. Most anglers are on the water a lot, a lot more than scientists. So they can give us real-time observations of are the fish getting smaller? Are there less fish? Are they behaving differently than they used to? Are they not in certain areas? And with that information, we can use that to inform science and research that can help improve the fisheries. When we have these problems or conservation concerns identified by anglers, we reach out or fund science to the researchers that are most capable of doing such work. That leads us to partnering with researchers at University of Havana, University of Stockholm in Sweden, all the Florida universities and all across the US. If, after we hear about the problem, say it's a smaller fish, less fish, we do the science, we find out it's a habitat issue, or we, or we do the science to find out it's a fishing overfishing issue. We then reach out to the appropriate management agencies to, to make change happen, to improve regulations, to fix habitats, or improve education to make the fishery better. So permit is a great example of what we do and um, what we've really learned a lot about the species. And personally, my favorite fish to target, whether it's on wrecks in the Everglades, Gulf wrecks, or or down in the Florida Keys and the flats. I grew up fishing for these things in Naples and I think they're super cool. As we all know, permit, the, the fisheries occur across South Florida and it's kind of expanding upwards past Tampa now. There's really two distinct fisheries for permit. There's the, the shallow water fishery. That fishery, it, it's sight fishing, hunting. Catch rates are super low, especially if you're using fly gear. If you're on a good day, if you know what you're doing, you can catch one permit on every three to five trips. <laughs> me, it's about Have one every 20. What is it? Oh, that Black encourages Black me. Devils? <laughs> I haven't seen it. No, I'll check it out. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I forget his name. Anyway, he's down in, in, in Sugarloaf. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting you. <laughs> the, uh, the fishery is uh, pretty, it's catch and release, low efficient, uh, low catch, catch and release. And in the Florida Keys and Biscayne Bay, our fisheries are world class and truly special because they're trophy fish fisheries. Here is the number of IGFA world record permit caught either on fly gear or on conventional gear. And in the, in the Keys compared to everywhere else in the world combined, uh, represented by the white bars. And more or less, you can see that about three to five times the world records were caught in the Keys or Biscayne Bay compared to everywhere else in the world combined. So we have an abundance of big fish which really makes our fishery special and economically lucrative. And as, as such, the flats fishery contributes to the overall $1 billion industry of fishing in the South Florida, Monroe County, and in Biscayne, generally about half a, million, half a billion dollars a year in economic impact for bonefish permit and tarpon fishing. So it's a, it's a great resource that it's, you know, we got to keep going for the long haul for everybody who's involved in it. There's also another fishery for permit. It, it's targeting them seasonally at their offshore aggregations. This happens across the state. The fishery is highly efficient. Our, we were out with a colleague and friend, uh, Captain Jason Stock in Tampa, who was helping us tag fish. And we got five and 15 minutes, which is not unusual if, if, you know, if you're in the right spot at the right time. <laughs> yeah, it's a little That's bit more harvest hard. oriented, FWC estimated through their, their process that about one, every other permit was harvested. This is about 10 years ago. So the numbers I'm sure are lower now, but still it's more of a harvest oriented fishery. And when we think about the two fisheries in general, it, the, the reports that we were getting was that the flats fishery was getting gradually worse over time. 
and the fish in the fishery were getting smaller and smaller. We're from 2000 to 2010, the average size of permit you would, you would see would be around 12 to 20 pounds. And now it's somewhere on the order of six to 12 pounds is about the average size with bigger ones mixed in, but, the, but a noticeable decrease in the size of the fish. Some, some quotes from guides that are in the fishery that kind of got us going on this was uh, someone like Justin Ray, who said, that's, I say I see way less fish than I- I'm sorry, I, I'm interrupting you. That's the guy who did the movie. Oh, Justin Ray? Oh, okay. Yeah, Black Tip Devils. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask him, ask him for a copy of it. <laughs> I will. You'll, you'll laugh. You'll, you'll die laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a cool guy. The first guy on your list. Okay, all right, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> So Justin Ray, he, he said, I see way less fish than I did when I started guiding, and I didn't know what I was doing then. Uh, Doug Kilpatrick, he used to have 30 shots a day, and now he's down to 10. Diego Ruiz says the fish are basically gone. Big fish are basically gone. I have I used to have 20 to 30 reliable spots, and now I'm down to about five. So there, there was this pattern we were getting that the fishery was getting worse, and which really inspired us to start a really strong research and conservation program for the species. Uh, it, it was kind of an uphill battle at first. There was more or less no or very limited scientific understanding of the species, especially as it's, as, as it's relevant to management. We had some idea of their growth rates and uh, kind of an idea of when they spawn, but their movements, their migrations, how connected all the fisheries were, we had, we had no idea. Uh, on top of that, you know, prior to about 2010, the fishery was kind of pretty open to harvest. It, there was a 10 fish bag limit per person. Uh, combined with Pompano at a small slot, but still, uh, you know, there was still some you know, 20 inch permit is still kind of good. And there was a pretty accessible commercial fishery for the species. So this, the first thing we did as we got started on this, we, 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 control, we, we communicated with FWC to see if they could do anything to pre preemptively or precautionarily reduce harvest for the Florida Keys flats fishery to let the fishery rebuild a little bit. And working with FWC, we were able to develop the, uh, the special permit zone that protects the Biscayne and Monroe County areas for harvest. It had a harvest closure during their spawning season, a, a more restrictive harvest of a one fish bag limit per person and great, greatly limited the commercial fishing areas available. So it was a good start. However, at the time we were doing this, we had no idea whether or not the permit that were on the shallow waters in the Biscayne area or the Keys area, if they were migrating up the coast in the Gulf where there was, you know, still the open fishery or migrating up the Atlantic where the fishery, open fishery exists. And if they were doing that, then this, 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 this spatial boundary they put around the, this area would, would have been meaningless. So we partnered with FWC Ed to do a uh, statewide angler-based recapture program, mark recapture program. We handed out tag, tagging kits to anglers and guides and asked them if they tagged fish to report the, the tag number, where they where approximate area where they caught it, the size, and then um, the date. More or less about 1,500 permit were tagged. There was a lot more tagged, but the, re, the reporting wasn't as great as we'd hoped. And overall, we had about 28 recaptured fish, which is a pretty, pretty solid number relative to the study. And what I'll show you next is kind of a map of the recaptures, so you can see how how connected these, these inside and outside fisheries are. And he, here is the, here's a map of South Florida. Uh, the, the red line shows the special permit zone. And each dot represents a uh, recapture lo of a location where, uh, where fish was tagged and recaptured. If the dot is white, that means that fish was recaptured in the, or, re or tagged in the keys. If the dot was blue, that means the fish was or recapture or tagged outside the SPZ or the special permit zone. So the idea is if these two fisheries are really connected the inside and outside the special permit zone, there'd be fish moving back and forth between the both zones. And as such, you should see recapture, you should see blue dots and white dots next to each other and randomly scattered across this area. But instead, what we really see is that basically if a fish was tagged in the Keys, or in Biscayne Bay, it was going to be recaptured in the Keys or in Biscayne Bay. And if a fish was tagged in the and off Naples, off Tampa, off Charlotte Harbor, it's going to be recaptured outside the SPZ or special permit zone. All every all the fish had that pattern except one that was tagged right on the right around Stiltsville, and was uh, subsequently harvested off a of pier 
near, I think, West Palm Beach or either Lake Worth. So apart from that one rogue fish, the, the special permit zone seems to really be at least the boundaries of it being really well protecting the permit on the flats and the shallow waters in Biscayne and, and the Keys. So that was that was good. That's really that was good to see that 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 zone kind of works. At least the boundaries are working. Uh, unfortunately, we were still getting reports five years later that the fishery is not really improving. It's still on that trajectory down, which inspired us to do some more work to better understand their movements within the special permit zone and to really evaluate the regulations within the special permit zone. Are, are the seasonal harvest closure matching when the permit are actually spawning? Are, are, um, there's other threats that we're not identifying. Are there, are there some areas that are just getting constantly beat up by boats running them over and all that stuff that we can address through management or education. So what we did is we launched a uh, five year long animal tracking study where we basically track the daily habitat, the daily movements of about 150 permit. We inserted a tag about the size of a double A battery in their abdomen, which is low, which is this, the photo with the quarter in it, a little surgery and stitched them up and he went on their way. Uh, we, we tracked them using a, an array of these canister looking like receivers that are, we had about 200 of them planted on the reef track wrecks uh, and, all, and all sorts of areas in the flats. And how this technology works is you put the tag in the fish, the tag sends off a signal that can be detected by these receivers. So when a fish swims by a receiver, um, you get that information of its day-to-day -day movements, when and where it went someplace, when and when, when and where and when it went to spawn and all that great stuff. So we could tell like when the fish left the flats to go places to spawn and, and, and use that to inform conservation. So we tagged about 150 permit. We tagged them pretty much in the middle keys and lower keys at this point in the study. Uh, we tagged evenly on the Gulf wrecks, West wrecks and the Marquesas and on the flats uh, and 50% uh, of them on the flats. So our first question we wanted to see is winter permit spawning. Is that May through July closure that the harvest closure really doing its job and protecting them with the, when they're spawning? And we determined that by when the permit left the, the, the flats and moved on to the, the wrecks, moved on to the, the, the reefs and all that stuff. And this, this is what the spawning activity of permit looked like in the Keys, particularly the shallow water ones. So here we have a month on the x-axis going from January to December and then spawning activity going up. And what you can see is where, where there's yellow and green and high bars means high spawning activity. And what you can really see is that in this red box in May, June, and July, that the spawning, the spawn has really started to wind down already. So the, the, the spawning season closure really wasn't doing its job to, to protect the spawning fish. So we brought that to FWC. And FWC decided that they should extend the, uh, the, the spawning season closure to include the month of April, which is great because that, that really kind of blocks in some of the more peak spawning months and provides them a little bit more protection than they had before. Um, so this, this is cool, this is cool. Our next question was really a where are permit spawning? Is there a particular spot that's more hot or more, more spawning activity than others? And is there any kind of stresses that's going on there that could disrupt your spawn or could, um, you know, sources of mortality, catch and release mortality and all that stuff. So what I'll show you next is kind of a map, a composite map of all the, the movements and migrations of all the 150 fish that we, we tagged and tracked. And what you'll see is uh, colors and lines and dots. And basically a dot connected with a line to a dot represents a, a place where a permit moved. A size of a dot kind of shows areas that are more hot for use or more per areas that permit spent more time at. And this is what this kind of looks like. And there's a lot, there's a lot in here that's, that's really interesting. So he, here's the movements of all 150 fish overlaid over the, the lower keys. And some really interesting things we can see at first. First, we can see that there's not a lot of movement between the Gulf wrecks and the flats, which is really, really interesting that the fish out in the Gulf just seem to be out there all the time and just, uh, just not contributing to the shallow water fishery. So in essence, you know, that boundary, the special management boundary actually could probably come in a little bit 
and still protect the flats fish like it's supposed to. We can see that we got a good movement coordination or movement tracks from permit across up, moving up and down the permit flats and all that stuff. But what we really learned from this was this area called Western Dry Rocks, which is in that black square box. And there that had more, detected more permit than anywhere else, had more spawning activity metrics than anywhere else. And particularly with the lower key, with the flats permit, it attracted about 71% of the fish that we tagged there, migrated to Western Dry Rocks during the spawning season, presumably to spawn. So an area of high use, particularly for these shallow water fish uh, and something that we were keeping our eye on. And it's not surprising that we weren't terribly surprised to see that uh, Western Dry Rocks, uh, it falls on this ocean gyre, this ocean current that called the Portelli's gyre. And basically, and if you're anywhere in South Florida, this is about one of the only places where you can really spawn and have your larvae end up being back in the Keys or in Biscayne Bay, because it gets caught up in this gyre instead of the Gulf Stream, and then spins back into the lower, into the Keys, Middle Keys, and Upper Keys. And if you're a fish, generally you want to spawn and put your larvae into places where you grew up successfully and did that as well. So what this spot, Western Dry Rocks, is also uh, a multi-species spawning aggregation. Seven other fish spawn there. There's a huge mutton snapper aggregation that's pretty well known. It's a big mangrove snapper spawn that happens there. Black grouper are, th are thought to spawn there. Yellowtail seem to aggregate there. And some other kind of other managed species, but not really that, that terribly important. It's also super popular to fish there. This is during the mutton snapper spawn. There's about 50 boats in about a square mile area. So it gets tons of pressure, uh, big known spot for spawning and uh, not, not, not great for the spawning fish that spawn there. So our next, our next layer of studies is really now to look at catch and release mortality. We know harvest could be happening. We know we addressed that with the extension of the closure. Now let's see if there's catch and release mortality that's worth doing something about. So we did a, a pretty comprehensive, two comprehensive catch and release studies looking at what habitats seem to have more permit catch and release mortality is, is that something to really worry about? So the first study was with the uh, University of Massachusetts. They, they had some pretty fishy dudes go out there and do a whole bunch of science on permit, catching them, monitoring their short-term behaviors to see if they got eaten by sharks and taking blood samples and all sorts of stuff for uh, metrics of stress that would say that they're gonna likely die if they were released in the long-term. And really what they found is this, the first thing they found that was super interesting is that with permit, as long as you get them past the sharks and you don't leave them on the boat for like five minutes, once you release them, they will all survive. Like they're, they're as long as they don't get eaten on the way up, they, they're gonna be good. They're, they're really hardy fish as long as they can get past the sharks. The second thing we learned is that there's a lot of variation about how, about where uh, shark mortality occurs. If we look at these Gulf wrecks out here, there's about four or five known ones that have permit. The, the depredation or the, the shark attacks there were about 60 per 80% of the fish they hooked got eaten by sharks. Um, if we look at the wrecks west of the Marquesas, it was, it was pretty variable depending on the day and the wreck. It was about 10 to 50%. The flats, it was really low, about less than 5% of fish got hooked that were eaten by sharks. And then at this Western dry rock spot, it was kind of in between the worst and the, and the, the not the, the, the less bad or, uh, you know, the pretty, pretty great, I guess. And that, and that was about 35% of the ones in that study got eaten by sharks prior to being landed. So still one in three is still a pretty big number considering that they're spawning, considering there's a lot of fishing effort out there and considering those are all, those are like a lot of the, the, the fish that make up the shallow water fishery. So we funded a follow-up study to go out Western Dry Rocks and really take a closer look at this. And this was through Florida International University. And what they used was a, this, this high-tech sonar gear to, that basically looks forward into the water about 100 feet, down into the water about 60 feet, and shoots out about 180 degree angle from the boat. So what it really allows you to do is see, confirm that a fish got eaten by a shark, didn't break you off on a wreck or reef, 
your gear, confirm that your gear didn't fail, and also tell you about what shark species are doing it, how the how the sharks do they like how what is their behaviors before they get the attack going, and a lot of stuff that can feed into management. So this this is kind of what their their data looked like when they when they were processing the results. So they hooked a permit, turned the turned the camera on, and what, again you're looking out about 100 feet into the water, dead in front of a boat. The permit is in this upper right quadrant. Let's see if I can get a, a laser pointer here. You'll see it kind of pop up around here. Um, you'll see the fighting the fish. It's just going up and down as they do. And eventually you'll you'll see what happens when the, when it encounters some sharks. So there is kind of it, it gets more clear in a second. So there, the, the permits, we're getting pretty locked in here. It's gonna show up here. There it is. We're getting, it's getting close to the boat. It's going up and down. And eventually you'll see two blobs move in on them on either side. So they're getting attention by critters. The sharks key in on them. Thing runs for the boat for cover and then gets smoked. It gets eaten right by the boat. It's really interesting. But yeah, you can learn a lot. Like it always seems to be more than one shark involved in the action. I don't, I don't know if the competitiveness fires them up or not. But um, and there's yeah certain species of sharks that really are doing it. Not, not nothing new to you guys if you're fishing on the reef a lot. Well, with that information, we, we were able to get some pretty good estimates of uh, fish depredation mortality of permit at Western Dry Rocks. And it's about 35% in 2018 and about 39% in 2019. So pretty consistent numbers across the years and, and enough given the location and fishing effort that this poses a big threat to the fishery. So we did a literature review to figure out when and where, when everything spawns out there. And the hot months are usually about April to July. And that, that lines up with when that gyre does seem to be at its strongest point. But uh, this April to July window is the, is the time that permit mutton snapper are both out there for the full year, full, full spawn. Mangrove snapper get a good, good protection a bit. And then a little bit of the, the, the other species that are not, not as critical in terms of aggregations and vulnerabilities and stuff. So we, we talked about it and we've, we've and come to the conclusion that in the short term, a seasonal no fish closure is the best available option to reduce this catch and release mortality that's happening for permit. And also protecting the other species that are taking advantage of this gyre that are spawning there and providing us with larvae throughout the Keys. We worked with some NGOs to, to see where they stood on this and all the fishing nonprofits, including Coastal Conservation Association, American Sport Fishing Association, Guy Harvey Association, and the International Game Fish Association, all were on board and saw the value of protecting this area, especially during those four months of the spawn. And with that, we worked with FWC to, to uh, implement a seasonal no fish closure at Western Dry Rocks. So this is, this is good. Nobody likes closures, but this is a very small one. And this is a really good spot to do it if you're going to do any, because you protect a lot of, a lot of spawning fish. Um, and yeah, you, and you help really, really provision the next generation of fish as well. So right now that where that's where we're at now, where our plan is to start moving our conservation work, our, our permit work up the keys a little bit. And most importantly, really focus in on habitat, move really strongly forward into habitat protection and flats protection and also improving water quality. But given how many boaters are on the water now, there's been a 70% increase in new boat, new boat owners that protecting the flats from prop scarring, from people running them over, uh, it, it's absolutely critical. And uh, we're gonna really move forward with that in the next six, to six months to start a campaign going to try to convince policymakers to take action and protect these habitats. We're doing the same with water quality. We, we have some really egregious water quality issues 
uh, in the Keys and in Biscayne Bay with leaky septic systems, uh, poorly managed shall, uh, sewage treatment plants, shallow wells that kind of just pump, water, pump sewage down 60 to 100 feet, and that just seeps right back up into our estuaries. And a lot of these aging infrastructure problems we're, we're going to be addressing in this new push. And all of this will be really working with FWC closely. And our, our goal is to really convince our work with FWC develop a management plan where they protect habitats as much as they protect, put effort into protecting harvest regulations and implementing those. And doing so, they'll give them the power to be able to find, or find different polluters and different people responsible for destroying an X acres of habitat. They'll be able to make them pay for it, hopefully, to fix, the, fix their problems, or at least pay for restoration efforts down the road. And a lot of that will be at our, our next symposium coming up here, assuming that COVID doesn't uh, ruin all that. We'll have 5,000 people there in attendance. We've invited Governor DeSantis so he can see all the science. We've invited <laughs> pretty much all, all sorts of different policymakers so they can see that and, and bring fishermen and stakeholders there so we can all talk about these issues and try to make some big change, especially on the habitat side moving forward. So that's it. Uh, I appreciate your, your patience and your attention and happy to take any questions on any of this stuff if, if you got any. So other the closures, then how does that affect us as fishermen? The closures, uh, ideally it should, in the short term, you start seeing bigger fish for permits, you start being, seeing bigger fish on the flats. And then a few years later, you should see more fish. Well, I, I, I guess I'm asking, what can we do to help? Oh, oh, uh, try to get to our symposium right now. Um, uh, see more research that we're going on. Be, become a member. Um, we'll have more tagging and tracking work going on up, up the Keys up coming soon in the next couple of years. Uh, certainly if you're good, you're fishy and can take us out permit fishing, we need help doing that. They're harder to catch than, they're harder for me to catch than anybody else, it seems like. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll have petitions and stuff going along. And once that goes, go, gets going, those would be great ways, great ways to contribute. I got a couple of questions, Herman. Go ahead. Dr. Ross, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, would we, will you send information to the uh, club, uh, uh, notifying us about that November meeting, uh, that's coming up that you just showed the flats expo? Russell, absolutely. And the second question is, uh, where more specifically is that Western, Western dry rock area? Is that Isla Mirada and Marathon or where is that? That's West of Key West. Um, West Key West. Yeah, Southwest to Key West. As far as the Marquesas. Yeah, in between the Marquesas and Key West. Okay. Okay. Just north of the lighthouse. Yep. So I thought it was very strange. It seemed to show that the permit out in the wrecks in the Gulf don't come to the Keys. Did I misunderstand? No, no, that's that's what the data showed. The tracking work showed that uh, we tagged plenty of fish on those Gulf wrecks, and they they didn't seem to move into the Keys. If you're familiar with them, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm surprised that you only tagged twenty fish out there because uh, I was out there fishing uh, two months ago. We got like seven or eight permit. Um, and uh, I mean, you could easily catch 30 or 40 permit there uh, in a day or two. So why are there so few out there? So few tagged? Yeah. Uh, we, we had limited resources. Um, we tagged a total between the wrecks west of the Marquesas and the wrecks in the Gulf. The numbers were about 70. There were, we tagged more than 20 on those wrecks. Um, I think we... We tagged about 15 on the P tower alone. Um, but we wanted to keep the, the sampling, the tagging effort a little bit more distributed across different places. Okay, well, if you want to tag some out at the blue hole, I'll take you out there. Yeah, all right, all right. 
Uh, do you have evidence that the permit on that Doxamilly wreck out from Caesars Creek there migrate into Key Biscayne? That's a good question. That is a good question. Uh, we've had a heck of a time, time and a trip when they're there to get some to get some samples from them and get some tags in them. Uh, every time we try to try to get out there, they're not there. Uh, but I would, it seems like anything that's spawning in the, in the Atlantic is going to be a flats fish or more, most likely is coming out of Biscayne Bay. Okay. So you think they do go out and come in? Yeah. yeah. All right. Do you have any, uh, feeling for the, um, uh... What's going on with the population in and immediately adjacent to uh, Biscayne Bay? The permit, the permit population. Yeah. yeah. And size. Not, we don't have a whole lot of a good grasp on them. Uh, we've tagged, we've tagged some fish there. They, they do, they stick around in Biscayne Bay for the most part, uh, upper keys a little bit. They don't seem to be going too far north, which is good, but um, very general understanding of them at this point. And we hope to change that in the upcoming years. I mean, I guess the question for you guys is what do you think they do? What, what's In Herman's world, reflecting on a few years of experience, Henry, uh, is uh, they've been in the South Bay, uh, September, October, and these are fish that are not resident. I mean, there's no way you could have a 25 pound fish in the South Bay as a permanent resident. So they got to be coming in off the wrecks and spending uh, whatever time they do. I've seen them going up the creeks uh, to eat the crabs. Um, I've seen them in pairs and threes. Um, and uh, they're usually in, like I said, in the fall time of the year. That sounds about right. That's interesting. Biscayne Bay, I guess, is a little different because you're so close to the mainland there, and it gets the water on the west side probably gets real hot. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, that's good to know. Well, hot water doesn't seem to bother the permit. Uh, no. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, I've, I've seen them all along the west coast of Biscayne Bay there, all the way up to almost. Uh, well, past the uh, Chicken Key up to Matheson Hammer. And down to Card Sound Flats. And down to Card Sound down. Flat, yes. Yeah, down to Card Sound Flat. And they, they come in off the wreck and spend the weekend uh, on, on the romantic weekend up in the, in the mangroves on the flats there. And then they go back out again, I think. There used to be one guide that specialized in bone fishing right around Chicken Key and the flat south of Chicken Key down to Black Point as the only area he fished for bone, I mean, for permit. Huh. And uh, You got to talk to uh, Gonzalez, right? What's his name, Peter? Joe. Joe. Oh, that's, they're there. Joe I'm Gonzalez. Thinking, I'm more of them there than any place Ross, else. You should, you should get a personal appointment with, uh, with uh, Joe Gonzalez because he is the yep, that's him. Right. permit uh, specialist. He even wrote a book on it, I think. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've, I've interacted with him a few times. He's a very nice guy. Yeah, 